up to this whipping post The Roman soldier stripped my clothes My back stretched out, I'm gonna prove I'm dying to be with you As I take the cross through crowds Curse my name and spit on me. It's crazy what love will make you do. I'm dying to be with you. You won't be born for a long time, but you're already on my mind. You're the reason why.
of your people. Lord, draw the sinners into this place to be saved. Lord, draw people in here and baptize them with the Holy Spirit. Oh God, that we might see your hand working in the hearts and the lives of people that live around us, oh God. That they too may know to call you Father. I'm a Father.
so thankful for your patience, your patience with me. Lord, my heart is prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. Just say, Lord, break my heart, <laughs> break my spirit, give me a heart that is repentant and contrite. That's what the Lord looks for in each and every one of us. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want, to, I want him to be my pilot through these raging storms. We're going through some raging storms in these days, but Jesus Christ is my po my pilot i see sometimes i used to or at least used to see bumper stickers that said jesus is my co-pilot no i'd rather have jesus in the pilot seat amen let's sing this hymn together jesus in your pilot Tonight, amen. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And one more time, you know, when I come down here and I pray, and then this morning, this evening I was praying for our nation, praying for our current president and his wife, praying for our current vice president and her husband. And you know the only problem with them folks, they just need Jesus. They just need to know who Jesus is. So many people, especially uh, in the political realm, they, they, they boast about a, a faith, their faith. I don't know what their faith is, but unless it's in Jesus Christ, it's nothing at all. And so I think it's appropriate to just one more time before we change here. Let's just sing this prayer that we've been praying. God bless America. said a good amen. 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 Praise the Lord. You may be seated for a moment, and it's just good to see you all back here tonight. Thank you for uh, being a part of our service this evening. Um, I probably won't hold you too very, very late tonight, uh, because when we're done and I get ready to leave the church, I have to call an air conditioning company to come and fix our air conditioner tonight. Uh, it's, it's been kind of a little toasty in our house today. Uh, and so I've got to get that done so that we can get some proper rest and so that I don't have to do it uh, tomorrow. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, see how, we'll see how the Lord moves. That's the most important thing. Uh, but um, uh, if everything runs smoothly, I'll, I'll try to get you out probably just a little earlier tonight. Uh, but I just want to just uh, share with you uh, reminders. Hey, we still got some of these door hangers. Uh, please take some. If you took some already, take some more. And uh, take the very last ones, too. And uh, let's put them out this week. Just hang them on some doors or just hand them to somebody, all right? And we also got the flyers. And that's for the festival this coming Friday. And uh, again, thank you to all of you who are planning on working that uh, day with us out here. It's going to be a fun event. It always is. And what a, what a joy to, to see the, the smiling uh, faces of families that come on and families that, that stop and thank us for doing that, how they so much enjoy it. And that is the reward to know that we're reaching out and so thank you for being a part of it helping us get the word out okay so that is the uh, big announcements for this week if you can help us get those uh, brochures and take some of those door hangers out there uh, and uh, we would appreciate that so very much uh, be sure if you didn't do so already uh, check in with the uh, desk on the way out, make sure they got you marked present tonight. That really helps us out a lot. Thank you for your giving today. Um, I'm, I'm saying that by faith because I have no clue <laughs> who gave. I don't know what was in there or what. I'm just saying thank you uh, for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, and if you did not uh, get an opportunity to give this morning, be sure to do it tonight. Or even if you gave this morning and you want to put an extra offering in tonight, uh, to help us out 
that is greatly appreciated. So thank you uh, very, very much for that. And I also want to say thank you, and I'm sure that uh, Nancy will have something in the bulletin next Sunday, but thank you to all, for all the cards and, and the gifts that you bestowed upon us today for pastor appreciation. We went through those today. Your words mean a lot to us. Uh, your gifts were very generous. Thank you so much. Uh, it really means a lot. And uh, we're, we're glad to be a part of a church family that loves one another. Amen? And I hope that you feel loved as well. I hope that you feel loved by the people around you and that you feel loved by us. But most importantly, that you feel loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Okay. I know that I just had you sit, but I'm going to have you stand now because I'm going to let you get out and share that love. All right. So uh, let's stand and uh, take a take a few minutes. We'll put the clock up. Get out and greet one another. Welcome one another. Uh, put a smile on somebody's face. All right. So let's start that clock.
All right, we make our way back to our seats. I was just um, thinking, of course, I didn't announce, I didn't announce today for more candy and uh, more chips and stuff for the festival because I was told that we are probably in good shape. But Linda, there's one more box right here. It was, so I'm going to put that over here. And uh, I don't want any of you to come down here when I'm not looking and sneaking. <laughs> that is not communion. All right. Uh, but if you, if you still want to bring some stuff in, you can do it. You just got to get it here uh, before Friday, preferably. You could bring it Friday morning early. Uh, we could always... Okay. Okay, you could bring it Friday morning. And preferably what we could use is, is candy. You know, we just need lots and lots of candy. But I, th I think we're well, but you never can have too much, okay? So, uh, um, and if we, if we finish up the event and we have some left over, we usually find some very good uh, organizations uh, that are going to be doing something later this month that, that they can use. So it does not go to waste. So anyway... All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tonight. I did decide I'm going to do one final message from that series I was doing on the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, for that, we're going to 1 Corinthians 13. And I want to talk to you about the gift of, of, of love. Love, and the title is Love Better Than All Gifts. And Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 13. It's, it's been quite a while since we've done this, but we even sing a song based on the, the words of 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, that's not a bad thing because music helps us to remember, helps us to memorize. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, let's look at the first 13 verses. If you're there, say a good amen. So though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now, abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is, say it with me, love. Last Sunday, we concluded the list of gifts that is mentioned in chapter 12. Tonight, I want to wrap this up by looking at what is considered the greatest gift of all of them. And we find this very detailed description of this gift written by Paul here in this 13th chapter. Let me just remind you of what Paul says in the last verse of chapter 12. He said, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And the more excellent way then is found in this 13th chapter. And here's what Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 30. He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor 
as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So there are three areas that I want to cover this evening, beginning with this one. And I want to start out with love's significance. Say that with me. Love's significance. So Paul gives us an idea of what we're like in the absence of love. He said that without love, I am nothing but a clanging symbol. In verse 2, he says that without love, I am nothing. In verse 3, he says, I can have all of these special gifts, but if I don't have love, I gain nothing. You know, there's a certain danger in the way we do things, and the danger is in doing what we do out of necessity rather than out of love. The danger is in serving faithfully but not lovingly. And there are many faithful preachers, missionaries, soul winners, teachers, deacons, church musicians who do a wonderful job for the Lord but they miss the blessings of God. Why? Because at the core of what they do there is the absence of one essential ingredient, which is love. Ulrich Zwingli, the early church reformer, said, All courage, skill, and faith are nothing if they are not judged according to love. In an article written for Leadership Magazine, Pulpit Helps writes this, Those to whom you minister may not always perfectly understand what you say but they will soon know whether you love them or not. The secret of many a successful Christian worker is not that he is skilled or has knowledge and has endowments which are superior to others, but that those to whom he ministers know that he really cares about them, not in some abstract way or from sense of duty, but wanting with all his heart the best that God wants for them. Friend, I'm going to tell you tonight that you can have the gift of knowledge, but if you don't have love, you're nothing but a clanging symbol. You may have the gift of faith. It's not hard for you to believe and follow God, but if you don't love, then you're nothing. God, help us to not only love what we do, but to also love those for whom we do it. I don't know about you, but I need my love restored at times. Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the I have to do this mentality and we forget the love aspect or sometimes we allow the hardships to cloud our minds that we focus on the negative and we forget about the love. How many would join me today and say, Lord, renew our love today? Amen? And that's why I stress so many certain things when I preach because I know that if I can get you to do this and do that, if I can get you to be faithful, if I can get you to be obedient and put God first, then you will be blessed and you will grow in God and your life will be filled with intimacy with God. But I'm going to tell you it breaks my heart when I see people just float along on their own way and they hear the word but nothing really changes. Or else they think they're okay but there's no fruit. There's no evidence of growth, maturity, in God. How many times have you prayed, Lord, let me see fruit grow in my life? Now, I've prayed, Lord, let me see fruit grow in my life, but Lord, let me see fruit grow in others. I pray this, this evening, Lord, let New Life Assembly of God be a church filled with big Christians. You know, where we have that love, where we have that, that heart for people, that we have that zeal and that passion to do whatever God wants us to do. My love for you compels me to preach what I preach, to teach what I teach, so that we can have all of God's blessings on us. But sometimes the hurts and the frustrations can cause that love factor to slip off in the background somewhere. When one does what he does without love, when there is the absence of love, then there is a vacuum that leaves an opening for something else to come in, and that something else is pride. Pride steps in and takes a seat in our life. 
D.L. Moody said, God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. Think about that one. Someone wants to find an egotist as a man whose self-importance makes his mind shrink while his head swells. We're talking about the danger of pride. And so I want to give you some, some danger signs this evening. One danger sign is when we feel that we are indispensable. You know, no one else can do what I do. Who, who would they ever get to replace me? Can I tell you something? Every single one of us are replaceable. And then the second sign is when we feel that we are superior. I'm the leader around here. If you need to know something, just ask me. Just ask me. That's a danger sign. Another danger sign is when we feel that we have to prove our worth. I received my edu education at Hippity Hop University. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can delineate all the famous philosophers. I can quote Shakespeare. I know my ABCs, and I have my degrees mounted on the wall in a six-foot matted frame. That's when we have to feel like we have to prove our worth. And then there's another one. When we feel our possession, or our, excuse me, our position is threatened. Who do you think they are coming in here trying to take over? And I've, I've worked with several people who have dealt with that issue, feeling like their position was threatened, and they get a little jealous or they grab onto it. There's something common to all of the above there in which I have just listed. And the thing that's missing is love and the danger of pride. And how many again would say, Lord, may we not be without love? The second area is love's manifestation. Love is expressive. Paul said that love is patient. Hey, if you ever want to know how you measure up in the area of love, just go back and review chapter 13. There are times when I read this and I realize just how far I, I fall short of God's love or God's idea of love. Love is patient with people. Have you ever had the thought go through your mind that said, you know what, this world would be a pretty good place if it wasn't for all the people in it? Pastors go home after church on Sunday and they say, Man, we would have a wonderful church if it wasn't for all the people. We get impatient with one another. And then love is kind. There are times when you haven't, when, when I'm sure that all of us could say there are times when we haven't been so kind. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. It doesn't get jealous over what somebody else does or what somebody else has. I remember in a, another church I was a part of and I directed a 50, 50 voice choir in that church and we were working on um, I think it was either probably Easter Easter musical and uh, we had uh, some really great singers and some great vocalists in that church we really did uh, and there were certain songs that I knew certain people they had the voice for and so one night at choir practice I appointed a song to one of the young ladies in the, in the, in the choir that I knew that she would, she would sing well. So, I mean, she had the voice. She could sing like Sandy Patty. She had a very high, high voice uh, as far as that range. And I knew that her voice would be good for that song. And I had a choir member speak out right out there in the open say, why do only certain people get, it, get songs? Aren't all of us good enough to sing a song? My answer was pretty short, no. <laughs> People get jealous. But love doesn't get jealous over what somebody else has or what somebody else can do. Love doesn't boast. It doesn't seek attention. It doesn't try to get everybody to focus on you because it realizes it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. And there are two types of people in the world. Those who come into a room and say, here I am. 
And then there are those that say, ah, there you are. Love is not proud. It's not arrogant or conceited. The one with love doesn't think of themselves any better than anyone else. Romans 12.10, Paul says, Be kindly affection, affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Philippians 2 and 3 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Does our love manifest itself in those ways? Do others see us and say they have genuine love? Love has a behavior. It's not rude. The person that is walking in love will always be in control of themselves and never out of order. Love is not self-seeking. It's more interested in others. Love is not easily angered. You're not so touchy. And sometimes you know how to even laugh at yourself. When was the last time you had a good laugh over yourself? We need to be able to do that, don't we? We take ourselves sometimes too seriously. We need to just sometimes just laugh. Love keeps no record of wrongs. That's a big one right there that we struggle with doesn't hold a grudge. It doesn't rehearse the past. It doesn't hold on to hurts. It lets them go because the person with love can give all of those hurts to Jesus. And that's when we realize that Jesus Christ is our defender. We don't have to be our defender. Jesus is our defender. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It doesn't revel in someone else's downfall or sin. It doesn't say, aha, they got what they deserved. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if we all got what we deserved, we would be in hell today. But love rejoices when the truth is advanced and the cause of Christ advances. Paul made mention one time that it didn't matter too much about the person who was preaching for the wrong reason, he was rejoicing simply because the Word of God was being preached. Does our love behave like it should? I mean, I've even said, I, I, I read something the other day, and it was something that I had to just kind of comment on, naturally. <laughs> but I read something that says, you know, and, and this person was in the apostolic uh, holiness movement, and he said, if you want to ruin an apostolic holiness church, and he listed all these things that you do, and one of them was take away the songbook and do this and do that, remove the choir and all of that. And I, my response simply was to a few of those things. I list them and I said, and the anointing is not in the songbook. The anointing is in the song." Am I right? We get so on these foolish ideas and these arguments. And I've, I've seen people sing a song and the anointing was there. Only later to find out that the person or the people or the group singing it weren't really living for the Lord like they should. What I'm just simply saying is that it's not necessarily as Paul was rejoicing. It do, it's not about the messenger. It's about the fact that the message is going out. And yes, I believe that the messenger should be living the way, way they, they preach or sing. I believe that the messenger needs to be a born-again believer and living their life for Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you, God will honor His Word no matter how it goes forth. He honored His Word with a donkey spoke it out. And I've known a few donkeys. <laughs> Love is full of patience. It always protects and it bears all things. We just take it when it comes, never seeking revenge, not complaining about the trials of life. And that one hurts to say because I really struggle sometimes just like you do. I don't mind being honest with you because I know all you folks struggle with those issues too. 
I know you pretty well. And you know me pretty well. But because we have love for one another, we can admit those things. Amen? Because love always trusts. It believes the best about someone. That doesn't mean we're gullible, but I believe it means that we're willing to look beyond faults and see the true nature of the heart. I've told our, our volunteer staff over the years many, many times, you may not always understand why I do something, but if you know my heart, then that'll be good enough. Love always hopes. It hopes for the best. Love's an optimist. It sees the church half full instead of half empty. It sees what a person can overcome, not what they are. Love always perseveres. It learns to take what life and people dish out because of love. The Scripture says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Is our love patient? That's a good question to ask ourselves. And then the third thing about love is that it is permanent. It's permanent in this present life and in the life to come. Love is more important than all the gifts put together, and we need to practice it in this life. It'll change us. It'll change others who know us. Love will endure where all gifts will eventually fail, whether they be prophecies, Paul said, tongues, knowledge, but love will always be. And Paul states that all the gifts mentioned in this chapter will one day fail and pass away, but love is here to stay. And this is why that we place a greater importance on love. Love will endure forever, presently and in the future. And then he says, for we know in part. You see, we have some degree of knowledge about spiritual matters, but we're confined and we're restricted in our knowledge. We use our God-given gifts to the best of our ability, but they, in and of themselves, provide limited understanding. We know in part because we see a poor reflection as looking in a mirror. But then he says, when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. Ladies and gentlemen, there's coming a day when you and I will have a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus Christ himself. And in that meeting, all truth will be revealed and all knowledge will be released and we will understand. We don't understand a lot of things right now that's happening, but we will one day, amen? We will. We will know. We will understand it better by and by, as the old song says. By and by, when the morning comes, when all the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story of how we've overcome, for we'll understand it better by and by. We will know God as He knows. Amen. And now, Paul says these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love comes from and emanates from God. The closer a man lives to God, the more he will love others. The farther away a man lives from God, the less he will love others. Some years ago, Dr. Carl Menninger, a noted doctor and psychologist, was seeking the cause of many of his patients' illnesses. And one day he called in his clinical staff and he proceeded to unfold a, a plan for developing in his clinic an atmosphere of creative love. All patients were to be given a large quantity of love. No loving, or excuse me, no unloving attitudes were displayed in the presence of the patients. And all the nurses and all the doctors were to go about their work in and out of the various rooms with a great loving attitude. They did that for six months. At the end of six months, the time spent by patients in the institution was cut in half. Think about the power of love. I, I wonder today what would happen if we apply that kind of prescription in our church. All members, all visitors, 
the young and the old, the well-dressed and not so well-dressed, everybody will be given large quantities of love. No unloving attitudes to be displayed in the presence of other members and visitors. And all board members and all teachers and leaders will go about their work in a loving attitude. Think about the changes. And at the end of six months, I just wonder what kind of growth that we could see and the joy in the fellowship of members. And I know that we're all human. Please don't sit there and think that I preach this and I've got it down. I'm, I'm still growing up. In fact, I'll tell some people, say, you know what? When I grow up, I want to be just like you. Because I've met those kinds of people. I'm still growing up. I know that many of you are still growing up. But aren't you thankful that God gives us a plan here for us to follow and a, and a, a road map to guide us along the way? And say, yes, Lord, I want to be like that. And when we take on that kind of attitude and we say, God, I want to be like that, God will help us become like that. He really will. So I would just close in this tonight and say, let's apply the words of Jesus Christ in John 15, verse 12, when he said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. And how did Jesus demonstrate that love? He gave himself. Are we willing to give ourselves? Would we be willing to die in someone else's place if it meant saving them? I remember hearing a story, and I've heard a couple of them, but I'll try to share this one as, to the best of my remembrance. And I believe it goes something like this, that there was a dad, he and his son and his son's friend went to the beach, and the two boys were out there, and all of a sudden the dad heard the cries for help. They got caught in the riptide. And when the dad rushed out to try to save them, his son was going under. But instead of reaching for his son, he went for the other boy. And as he went for the other boy, his son went under and drowned, died. When he was asked why he chose the other boy over his son, he said, because I knew my son was ready to meet Jesus, but I didn't know if this other boy was or not. That is a powerful measure of love for mankind. I pray that God would fill us all with that tonight, don't you? So I want us just to pray this evening. I'm not even going to ask you to come to the front. I just want you right where you're at. Just look up to the Lord and say, Lord, fill me with that kind of love. That's the greatest gift. Lord, we desire all the gifts. We desire the greatest gifts. But Lord, most importantly, we desire that gift of love. Let us love others as you loved us. Let us be willing to give if it means blessing someone or the salvation of someone. Lord, help us to help us to show the characteristics of the 1 Corinthians 13 model. Lord, when we do the uh, festival on Friday, I know, Lord, by the time it starts, many of us are going to be tired and pretty exhausted. But Lord, I pray that when people start to walk on this parking lot, first of all, 
they would recognize that they're stepping on holy ground. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would begin to deal with hearts. For there are people that live around us that do not know you. And there's a church right here in the middle of people who are dying and going to hell. And I pray, Lord, that as they begin to walk through and they begin to mingle and play some games, eat a hot dog, have some fun, I pray that your love in each and every one of us will well up to help us to reach out to them and display that love to them. Lord, so that when they go home at night, they will look at each other, their spouse or their kids. Or even if they are by themselves, they may think to themselves, that was something different about those people. And I pray, Lord, that they would return to hear who makes the difference. And that's Jesus Christ. Let our love be displayed. Let it be patient. Let it be kind. Let us not point the attention to ourselves, but to point all of the glory and all the attention and all the honor to you, Lord. Lord, when these folks here, those that go to work every day, when they go to work starting tomorrow, I pray, Lord, let the love of Christ just flow through them. Let it just exuberate from them that their co-workers will see something's different about them. And that difference will cause them to seek and they will find. Lord, we're your people. And we just pray your will be done in us. That you receive all the glory and all the honor because you're worthy of it all. We're your servants. We're here to go and we're here to serve at your will. This church, Lord, is here to reach people, to minister to their needs. And Lord, we look to you to be our source and give us the ability and the resources to effectively minister to people. Lord, because we want the world to know they are loved by you and you demonstrate that love through your people. We give you praise and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. How many of you will plan on going out this week and showing the love of Christ to somebody? Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna end it right there. I think that's a good note to end it on. And uh, let's now go and take what we've heard. Let's apply it. And uh, the best way to apply it is start the day out. Say, Lord, I'm gonna need your help today. Gonna need your help. Cause can I let you in on something? You may not un you may not realize this, but first thing in the morning. The enemy is going to come knocking at your door. He's going to try to mess you up. But you know what? You can rebuke him in the name of Jesus. And don't forget, like I said this morning, you will find power along the way. Just take those steps and find the power. God bless you tonight. Go ahead, let's stand. Consider yourself dismissed. And uh, go show the love of Jesus to somebody. I'm going to... I'm going to show the love of Jesus to an AC guy at my house when I get home. So, all right. God bless.